I'm Martin Long, uh, Director of Professional Education at uh, Heidelberg Engineering, and I'd like to show you the Spectralis uh, Glaucoma Module Premium Edition. Uh, this is like a toolkit for glaucoma evaluation, uh, and we use essentially three components. We look on the neuroretinal rim, and there we use Brooks membrane opening uh, as uh, the true anatomic location of the disc margin and we can uh, measure from Brooks membrane opening to the inner limiting membrane the minimum amount of rim tissue that the patient has. Then we move uh, to the peripapillary nerve fibre layer uh, and we use the circle scan for this and we can see how the profile of the nerve fibre layer is and also uh, the thickness of the nerve fibre layer. Uh, finally we move uh, to the macular area and we do a complete posterior pole scan uh, where we can then segment all of the layers of the retina uh, and particularly looking on the ganglion cell layer where we're looking for notching uh, of ganglion cell layer across the horizontal midline and looking for imbalance or asymmetry between the upper and lower hemifields. So let's do a scan uh, and show you what we do. Uh, and then look at the information that we get afterwards that might help you with uh, your glaucoma evaluations. So what we have here is a, an anatomic positioning system and we're going to automatically identify the fovea uh, and then four primary points of Brooks membrane opening which should be the true anatomic disc margin. And we're going to do this before we do any scanning and the reason for this is that everybody uh, has a different orientation, a different angle of the fovea to the disc and so we need to uh, isolate this uh, before we start scanning. Uh, so what we're going to do is start fovea detection. Uh, I wait for the blue bars to complete and we confirm that position then we move to the optic nerve, start BMO detection, wait for the blue bars to complete and we confirm BMO position. So the anatomic positioning system fixes uh, the location of the fovea to the centre of the optic disc uh, and this is for every individual patient. Now if I ask my patient to slightly move their head you can see that that is fixed and this is confirming that we have true track live eye tracking uh, working and this gives you very high reproducibility on your follow-up. Now we fix the axis of the fovea to the optic nerve centre uh, for each individual eye uh, and now we can start scanning. So I'm going to press acquire and we're going to do 24 radial scans of the optic nerve head uh, and identify 48 locations of Brooks membrane opening. Then we're going to do three nerve fibre layer circle scans, one at 3.5 millimetres, one at 4.1 and then 4.7 millimetres. We're complete. Now we're going to do the posterior pole scan to look on the whole of the macular area and we see the retina there in position and I'm going to acquire the image and we're going to do uh, ART9, an averaging of nine scans per B scan. Uh, and then we can segment all of the layers uh, and look on the ganglion cell layer. So let's do our follow-up now uh, and you can see here that we've automatically uh, preset uh, the location of the fovea uh, to the disc uh, and here we're going to use uh, again uh, TrueTrack live eye tracking uh, and this was originally developed by Heidelberg for the Spectralis uh, and it's one of the very nice features that gives us very high reproducibility uh, when we come to look at follow-up. So we're going to acquire the image again and again, uh, 24 radial scans, 48 locations of Brooks membrane opening and three nerve fibre layer circle scans. And each circle scan has ART 100, so it's an averaging of 100, which is also a very high quality contrast and detail. Let's again do follow up on the posterior pole and we move to the retina. We're in position, all preset, and we acquire our image. And if I ask our patient to sit back away from the camera, you can see that our scan has stopped. And this demonstrates the live eye tracking function that we have. Uh, and so uh, 
because the machine doesn't recognize the retina any longer, it stops. So if I ask our patient to sit back in position and I get in position, we can continue exactly where we left off from before. And you know that you always have very nice, accurate scanning and especially for follow-up. So let's look at our results and uh, see what we've got. Uh, we can actually extract the infrared uh, fundus image from the OCT and this is nice because uh, I use this normally as a control. Uh, it's an infrared reflectance image and I can see the configuration uh, of the optic nerve and I can see the configuration of the neuroretinal rim. I also can see how is the vessel trunk and typically the vessel trunk is in like a C curve position and this is important to know uh, because this will affect uh, and dictate the location of the double hump position on the nerve fibre layer profile when we start to look on the nerve fibre layer. Um, this is a structural diagnostic image and actually you can see very clearly that there's a focal nerve fibre defect here. Um, typically a uh, healthy nerve fibre is very highly reflective and bright and sick nerve fibre is looking dull and so you can see that focal nerve fibre defect there already just in the infrared uh, confocal fundus image. We are going to look systematically uh, every time uh, we take a holistic approach to glaucoma and so we're going to look uh, step one at the neuroretinal rim then we're going to move to step two the peripapillary nerve fibre layer and then finally we're going to follow the axons round and we're going to look at the ganglion cell layer uh, and look and see if there's any notching of ganglion cell layer across the horizontal midline uh, which is where we will normally see uh, changes relative to glaucoma. So let's look at our OCT. We're going to look first of all at the neuroretinal rim uh, and we have identified 48 locations of Brooks membrane opening and we can measure from Brooks membrane opening which should be the true anatomic disc margin from Brooks membrane to the inner limiting membrane we can measure the minimum amount of rim tissue that the patient has all the way around the optic nerve. Uh, we also can, from these 48 locations, identify what is the size of the disc according to those true anatomic positions. And in this case, this patient has a disc size of 1.93, which we might consider uh, a fairly average size disc. And so I would think then the profile of the neuroretinal rim should follow pretty much this green line uh, identified in the middle of the normative range. If the patient has a smaller disc, let's say 1.5 millimetres squared or less, um, then I would expect that all the nerve fibres are squeezed together uh, and naturally you'd have a little bit higher position to your neuroretinal rim and we wouldn't expect to see cupping. That's a very bad sign if you uh, have a smaller disc. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a larger disc, uh, 2.5 millimetres squared or more, I would expect the nerve fibres to be spread out uh, and naturally you would see more cupping. And from the neuroretinal rim position point of view, I might expect the rim to be a little bit lower in profile. This patient has an average size disc, and I can see from the profile that there's a depression here, more nasal superior area, but a larger depression in the temporal inferior uh, location, and that is actually consistent uh, with what we've already seen in the confocal infrared fundus image. So typically uh, from the OCT point of view I say three strikes and you're out and this is the first strike the neuroretinal rim don't like the look of the profile of that uh, neuroretinal rim. So let's go to step two and we look on the peripapillary nerve fiber layer circle scan. The beauty of this is that you can see very clearly the actual tissue of the nerve fibre layer here and you can see whether or not the machine has segmented that nerve fibre layer properly uh, and you can see that we're not picking up any uh, vitreous membrane that might give us any uh, some false readings in, in terms of thickness. Um, so this is a very nice feature uh, to be looking on uh, and if this is looking good you can be sure that the profile of the nerve fibre layer is, is good uh, and that the thickness measurements are reliable. Uh, and if we look on the profile, you can see that we've got a very large chunk out of our temporal inferior uh, hump. Uh, and this is consistent 
with that depression that we saw on the neuroretinal rim. So we've got a correlation between the neuroretinal rim uh, and the peripapillary nerve fibre layer. And so therefore I've got two strikes out of three uh, from a glaucoma point of view for this patient, unfortunately. Let's move finally uh, to the macula. And we've done a posterior pole scan across the whole of the macular region here. Uh, and then we can segment all of the layers of the retina and particularly interested in looking on the ganglion cell layer. Uh, so we go to the posterior pole, which is a full retinal thickness map. Um, and so long as you haven't got comorbidity and uh, retinal condition combined with glaucoma, you can see patterns of damage relating to glaucoma even with a full retinal thickness map. So I can see a focal nerve fibre defect here, like a river going to the lake. Uh, that focal nerve fibre defect and I can see the associated notching uh, of ganglion cell between the inferior hemifield compared to the superior hemifield. Uh, and we use the principle of asymmetry, rather like glaucoma hemifield test in visual fields. We use the same principle, uh, although we're looking at thickness changes. So here you see the difference between the upper hemifield and the lower hemifield, and these black areas here indicate that we have changes which are at least 30 microns thinner than the corresponding location in the upper hemifield. So this is an important uh, observation in glaucoma. We look at uh, asymmetry within the eye and also a symmetry between the eyes. Now we can segment the layers and let's have a look on the ganglion cell layer. Uh, then it becomes very obvious uh, that we have uh, an early ganglion cell layer notching here in the lower hemifield that's following on from these axons from the optic nerve around and you can see a value of 25 on average thickness of ganglion cell layer uh, in the inferior hemifield compared to 46 just opposite across that horizontal midline. So this was a typical pattern, like a snail shell, that we might see in an earlier stage of glaucoma. We also have deviation maps, which show you how does the patient compare to normative data, and it's very visual. So here we can see that actually, the loss of ganglion cell layer, uh, or damage compared to normal, is even further temporally than we might think uh, relative to that snail shell uh, pattern. We also can evaluate the full retina and if we look at the full retina you can see those changes coming from the optic nerve out. Uh, we have depression or loss of tissue there if we look at the full retina. If we look at the nerve fibre layer you can see the full extent of the loss of nerve fibre layer compared to normal from the optic nerve right out starting to join up to the ganglion cell layer and there's the ganglion cell layer loss. Um, and so we have really a, a view of the whole picture. We take a holistic approach uh, and we don't look at just one parameter. We look from the neuroretinal rim to the nerve fibre layer, to the posterior pole, to the ganglion cell layer. And we have much more confidence in our uh, evaluation of that eye from a glaucoma perspective and may even be able to identify patterns that are non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy as well.